Your disciplinary panel discussion this morning. We've got both an audience online and an audience in the room, so we're going to uh, work that out. Uh, just bear with us. Um, we also have a panel this time with one panelist online and two panelists here in the room. So um, our focus this morning, oh, I should say I'm Mary Watson for anyone who doesn't know me. I'm the director of the Coastal Resilience and Sustainability Initiative and delighted to be hosting this morning. Um, so our, our topic this morning is coupled human natural systems. And that uh, refers to the dynamic two-way interactions between human systems, so think our social fabric, our culture, our economy, our governments, and the like, and natural systems, i.e. I our hydrology, our atmospheric processes, our biological, geological processes and systems. So how do these two work joined together? Um, if we're thinking about coupled systems, and we're trying to understand those dynamics. Uh, by definition, we need interdisciplinary teams. And to look at coupled human natural systems in the context of our most pressing grand challenges, including climate change, coastal resilience, and sustainability, there are myriad natural science, social science, and engineering components to doing that. So this morning, we have a stellar panel um, representing those three dis uh, groups of disciplines, the natural sciences, the social sciences, and engineering. And I want to start by asking each of our panelists to introduce themselves to tell us who they are and a little bit about what you do. And maybe we'll start with Dr. Casey Dietrich, who just joined us on the screen in the room. Casey, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. I had another appointment that just ran into the start of this one. So thanks for, for allowing me to join virtually. Yeah, I'm, I'm Casey Dietrich. I'm an associate professor in the civil engineering, civil construction, environmental engineering department. Um, I've been here about eight years, and I represent the coastal engineering team. Um, my specific research is all about modeling and prediction of coastal hazards. So I'm trying to build models for storm surge, coastal flooding, coastal erosion, uh, really looking at uh, hazards during the discrete events. So during a specific storm timescales of a couple of hours or a couple of days, um, but looking over large scales. So trying to represent flooding over an entire state or, or multiple states. Um, we do that through large finite element models. Uh, we try to run them in real time or we support others, other collaborators who run them in real time. Um, our results are used by emergency managers around the state and around the country, but also for long-term planning by FEMA or the Army Corps of Engineers. So thanks, thanks everybody for the opportunity today. That's awesome. Uh, Dave, would you like to go next? Sure, yeah. Good morning, everybody. My name is David Eggleston. I'm a professor of marine science in the Department of Marine, Earth, and Atmospheric Sciences in the College of Sciences. Uh, I'm a marine ecologist. Uh, I, I work on a broad array of, of uh, questions, but I look for opportunities to frame my research uh, within the ability to test ecological concepts and with the answers, hopefully, that can not only address uh, how those concepts apply in marine systems, but also answers that, that will come out to help uh, guide management of, of fisheries habitat and, and fishery species. So I interact with the uh, North Carolina Division of Marine Fisheries, the North Carolina Coastal Federation, uh, our federal agencies, such as the uh, National Marine Fisheries Service, as well as some of the management councils. I also serve as director for NC State's Marine Lab. It's known as CMAST, or the Center for Marine Sciences and Technology. That's located in Moorhead City. Uh, we're very unique in that we have faculty, staff, students from three colleges, four departments, and a K-12 STEM education program. Uh, also embedded in our facility, we serve as a satellite campus for the North Carolina Sea Grant program, uh, and we have professional staff from the North Carolina Aquarium as well as the North Carolina Division of Marine Fisheries. And I uh, need to put in a plug for our undergraduate programming. So. Uh, excited that we have a, a cohort of our 2020 
uh, spring 2020 cohort of undergraduates that will be based at CMAST. Uh, and so I invite you to uh, go to our website and look at the opportunity to participate in the spring 2023 version of the semester at CMAST program, but also look at our summer fellows program uh, for undergraduates. Okay, thank you. Great. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Gavin Smith. I'm a professor in the Department of Landscape Architecture and Environmental Planning. Uh, my areas of research are hazard mitigation or risk reduction, uh, disaster recovery, and, and climate change adaptation. Uh, but I also uh, teach a graduate certificate in disaster resilient policy, engineering, and design, which is a real interest of mine. Uh, I think, like Dave, is how do we bring together interdisciplinary teams to tackle these really pressing issues we'll talk about today? And so the, the certificate program is, uh, while housed in the College of Design in my home department, um, it also has linkages and tracks that are design related, engineering related, and policy related. And so graduate students that might be interested in pursuing that, certainly happy to, uh, to talk with you uh, about that. The other thing I'd mention relative to students, um, I'm also the uh, faculty leader of a student, a self-formed student group, which I'm really pretty proud of, called Has Nerds. Um, that was the name that the students came up with. If you're interested, it's uh, I think over 350 students on campus are participating in it. It's a chance for students to learn about job opportunities, classes, uh, they have special readings and so forth. It's a really pretty uh, interesting group. Uh, so let me know if you'd be interested in, in talking more about that. Uh, perhaps the last thing I'll talk about is, is my career has, has spanned um, the academy uh, as well as the private sector and government. And I'm really interested in uh, deep community engagement and how we better translate what we know about natural hazards, disasters, and climate change adaptation uh, to try to better inform communities and try to inform better policy that reflects what we know. Uh, we're still not doing a, a good enough job of translating what we know into practice. So, thank you. Well, thanks, Gavin. Um, before we continue, I'm going to throw some questions out. I want to let everyone know that this is not just me and the panel talking. We're going to invite you, as soon as you're ready, to ask questions of, of the panelists. And uh, if you're in the room, if you can raise your hand, we'll, we'll call on you when the time comes. And if you're online, uh, you can either put your question in the chat and Amanda will read it, or you can raise your hand so Amanda knows you have a question. And this time around, last time we weren't able to do that because all of our panelists were here, but now we're set up with both and live audio. So we can call on you and you can ask your question um, as well online. But I'm gonna get the, the questions going and get the discussion going and then uh, all of you can, can chime in when you're ready. So. Um, this area of coupled human and natural systems is the largest area of stated interest by the almost 230 um, individuals who responded to our interest survey um, last year. And um, that's a, a huge swath of, of folks in departments and in colleges. And Gavin used the word deep. If we think about deep integration of human and natural systems that incorporates climate change scenarios, um, that, that's a complex thing to do, but it's absolutely essential in thinking about long-term sustainability and, and how we get there. Um, each of our three panelists, you have very different uh, disciplinary training, very dis different languages in the science uh, that you do, the engineering uh, that you do, and you bring a different sort of mindset to the challenge of, of coupled human and natural systems. I wonder if you talk a little bit about how you first frame your thinking or approach challenges of coupled human natural systems and moving towards uh, sustainability in your disciplines what does that mean to you, and, and how do you approach it? Sure, yeah. Um, you know, Mary alluded to sort of a general description of coupled uh, human natural systems. I guess one practical way to think about it is um, how does the public, how do resource managers, how do uh, permitting folks such as a town council make a decision on whether or not to conserve 
uh, a natural habitat or allow for, say, construction. So what are the cost benefits and that goes into a, a making a decision like that? So when I think about coupled uh, natural human systems, I, I like to break things down into its components. So, for example, my expertise would be in the dynamics of that natural system. So, for example, if we're talking about, uh, you know, seagrass or salt marsh or, or mangrove, these really important coastal habitats, there are a lot of ecosystem services that those habitats provide, but their dynamics are driven both internally and externally. So, for example, with uh, seagrass, uh, you know, think of uh, seagrass as any sort of plant crop. And so, you know, a, a crop of apples, apple trees are going to be responding to the weather patterns. So seagrass uh, species are, are, are no different. They're responding to rain events that are influencing salinity. They're responding to light levels. They're responding to storm. And they're responding, their sort of growth dynamics are also responding to the production of seeds, where those seeds land and, and how they sprout. And so another component of that is then, for example, the fishery species that reside in that seagrass. So when you look at, uh, say, larval finfish that might settle in seagrass, what is their growth and survival and eventual production to the fishery compared to, say, a larval fish that would settle in an unstructured habitat? And so there's a benefit there that directly relates also to, um, to humans. So first component is the dynamics of the natural system. The second component is the dynamics of that human system. And so, uh, you know, how, how, does human, how do humans perceive the benefits of seagrass and how might that play into their uh, response, you know, what, uh, to say this question of whether to develop nearby, control water quality nearby or, or not. And then um, the third component is then how is that natural system influencing humans? And so, as I mentioned, uh, that seagrass is providing, uh, uh, there's oxygen production as these seagrasses are photosynthesizing during the day. There's some erosion control. Um, there's actually benefits to real estate. Uh, uh, houses that are located near uh, high quality seagrass beds uh, have higher value. And of course there's fishery uh, production. So those are examples of how the natural system is influencing the human system. Now, the fourth final component is then, you know, how is the human system uh, influencing that natural system? And of course, we can, uh, uh, there's a whole list of ways that we can influence that seagrass habitat that are, uh, that range from regulations associated with water quality, uh, regulations having to do with, say, boating use in these seagrass areas, as well as um, uh, the amount of fishing pressure that might be taking place in or near these habitats. And so, so again, that's why we need these interdisciplinary teams that speak these different languages. They have different response variables that they quantify. Um, for example, the social scientists would identify, well, who are the stakeholders that are uh, going to be impacted by decisions related to the management of, of seagrass? And then how might uh, identification of those stakeholders uh, interact with the scientists who are, are trying to uh, communicate the uh, ecosystem services of seagrass, for example. So that's how I, I think about it in terms of breaking it down into the components. And then as uh, one that, uh, that has expertise in the natural dynamics, the other issue to be thinking about is how is climate going to be impacting these natural systems. And I think we're, we're seeing a great example of that here in North Carolina. Uh, for example, one of the dominant seagrass species is Ostera marina. Uh, we're on the southern uh, biogeographic range of that species, and so as temperatures warm, we're seeing a senescence or loss of that seagrass species earlier and earlier in the year. Uh, Zostra has pretty thick blades, so it provides pretty good structure for uh, fishery species, and we're seeing that being replaced by other more tropical uh, seagrass species that have thinner blades and may not provide the uh, ecosystem services that Zostra provides. And then lastly, uh, with Hurricane Dorian, a few years ago, we saw that that actually created new inlets in southern outer banks. So what happens when we have these storm events like that that are actually uh, all of a sudden cutting through the outer banks, allowing higher salinity water uh, to influence these seagrass beds, but also the sediment that's transported into these areas and burying seagrass. So there's a lot to be thinking about uh, as we think ahead about how climate change is impacting these, these uh, natural system dynamics.
maybe a, a nice segue uh, from what Dave is speaking to is that you know my background is uh, really environmental policy and the kind of disaster resilience and climate change adaptation, kind of the policy side. And in the certificate program that I teach, one of the key themes that we talk about repeatedly, in fact, talked about it last night, is the idea that natural hazards are natural, which sounds obvious. Uh, they're part of the natural environment is really a better way to put it. Uh, disasters in many ways are a human construct. Uh, you know, floods are normal. Hurricanes are normal. Um, coastal erosion is normal. It's when they intersect with the built environment or the environment upon which we depend uh, that can lead to to disaster. And so I'm I'm really interested in that um, that interface. And so that's something we we talk a lot about in class. But we also talk about in the context of policy, one, some of the, a lot of the research that I've been focusing on over the last several years is uh, how are we going to adapt uh, to these more intense storms, uh, more intense rainfall, sea level rise, and so forth. And one of the big policy strategies that uh, the U.S. and countries all over the world are exploring is the notion of what's being called retreat. Um, in fact, a lot of people in coastal North Carolina don't even like the word retreat. We can talk about language. But um, the idea of the relocation of vulnerable populations, uh, it's happening all over the U.S., it's happening all over the world. And so we're studying policies that look at what are often called, if you ask someone in eastern North Carolina, they wouldn't know the word buyout, uh, where homes are acquired typically with post-disaster money, the houses are torn down, and the land is turned into open space. So one of the big questions that we're exploring, looking at it from a policy and a landscape architecture lens, is, well, what do you do with that land? How could it perhaps be utilized to deal with, um, say, migration of different coastal species? Or how can you use this land in a thoughtful way that deals with not only ecosystem restoration, but um, recreational opportunities or economic development or aesthetics or other water quality related issues? And so this interface of uh, our changing natural systems and the idea, many of you may not know, there are, give or take, about 9,000 parcels that have already been acquired in eastern North Carolina that have been converted to open space. But if you go to eastern North Carolina, especially in the riverine communities, many of these smaller communities are struggling as to what to do with this land. They don't have the resources to manage it. Even the most basic needs, uh, literally maintaining it, mowing it, and so forth. Uh, while it sounds like getting really detailed and focused, is these are big issues that we're interested in unpacking, including uh, in particular, and I think it's an important policy issue to talk about today, is a lot of the communities, uh, to me, the greatest threat is how do we advance, for lack of a better term, rural resilience? How do we engender and build the capacity of small at-risk communities to, to deal with these changes? Um, the grant programs that are available to do a lot of this work are really complex. Um, they're really difficult to administer. They take a lot of staff time and resources to do it. A lot of eastern North Carolina communities can't do it. Uh, it's, it's, it's very difficult for them to do these things. So, again, this interface between uh, public policy and ecosystem management and risk reduction and resilience are all intertwined. And to me, the big issue, um, frankly, one of the big issues that we're facing is how do we engender federal and state uh, government and other actors to build the capacity at the local level to, to become more resilient. And I would argue that we're, we're certainly not there yet. Casey, how does an engineer think about all these things? I, I struggle with this question. So you, this was one of the questions you shared ahead of time, Mary, and, and really struggle with it. I liked how, how Dave broke it apart into um, different components. So, you know, people who are maybe focused or thinking about the natural or engineered system, people who are maybe focused or specialized in the, the social science and then the, the feedback backs back and forth. For me specifically, I'm, you know, very much in that, that bin of just natural and engineered systems, trying to understand, you know, how our coastlines are responding to, to storms uh, now and in the future, um, trying to build better models that, that consider those climate change scenarios um, and trying to bring in, more accurate predictions of storm surge and erosion. And so very much in kind of a hazard characterization, characterization um, kind of framework. And, you know, that's part of the, the question, but it's just one part. And, and so trying to connect across. Mary, you mentioned that, you know, this interest area coupled natural and human systems garnered the most interest from across the campus. And I think it'd be fascinating to see um, people um, respond to, to the next level. So 
in those four categories that, that Dave laid out, where where do you see yourself? Um, probably a lot of folks are on one end of the spectrum or the other, either you know focused on the natural engineered system or focused on the human side. And it's it's much more rare. I think it's much harder to be uh, in the middle. So making those connections or, or coupling between those systems. Let me ask one more question, then audience, be ready. I'm going to look and see what you might have on your your mind. But you know, a key piece of of, of um, you know that thinking about all the complexity and the components is how they come back together uh, in terms of creating a different kind of a future. So a lot of, of work focused on coastal resilience is all about how can we create a different future, um, which means we need to understand what people want, and then we need to understand how we get there, um, which has a, a lot of different uh, components to it. We're, we'd be doing things like juggling community needs, thinking about questions of equity and uh, health and economies. and. We want to protect our natural habitats. Dave mentioned the seagrass and fisheries production and all the rest of that. Wetlands store floodwater. Floodwaters are becoming a bigger and bigger problem, and engineering can address that. Maybe, maybe not. You know, Trade-offs between how we do all of those those things. Can you share some examples, um, any and all of you, from your work uh, about how you see into the future? and think about both the human side and sort of the natural capacity and engineering opportunity, and then balance those trade-offs to move towards something that is socially desired. Maybe I could take a, take a sure, stab at sure. it first. Um, is, to me, one of the things and kind of bringing it up to kind of a broader level of this notion of resilience that has become a buzzword is, you know, one of the really important themes of resilience is diversity. It goes back to its ecological roots um, in many ways. Um, and the reason I mention that is think about um, the diversity of policy approaches, the unidimensional approach uh, of a seawall or of one action in and of itself is, is can be problematic. And you know, think about uh, what's happened in New Orleans, you know, rebuilding the, uh, you know, $14 billion spent on rebuilding the, the levee system in New Orleans. And I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't have done it. What I'm saying is that uh, being very reliant on a system, an engineered system, uh, is uh, fraught with challenges because if that system breaks, uh, not only can it lead to greater loss, but it also has the perverse incentive of encouraging development behind it. And so an era of climate change, uh, and to me this is one of the fundamental questions of our time, and for all of you as students to, to think through whether you're an engineer or a policy person or a, a social scientist, is what's the right design standard? And who decides? Who pays for it? Uh, we're dealing with issues of uncertainty. Casey and, and Dave could certainly speak to this issue perhaps better than I, but one of the big challenges we face from a policy standpoint is the notion of non-stationarity in that the programs or the risk models that we've developed have typically looked into the past to help us predict the future uh, and think about flood mapping or flood modeling. Um, and in an era of climate change, this notion of non-stationarity means that the models have to be modified and you have to be planning for a greater uncertainty. And those are issues that we're all uncomfortable with in some ways. We study it, but I mean, the society is uncomfortable. They want an answer and we don't know uh, with great certainty as to, you know, sea level rise or more intense storms that's happening, but the rate and the extent and the magnitude change over time, coupled with investments in physical infrastructure or nature-based solutions, you know, the, the life of those infrastructures um, may exceed that period that we, we designed it at one point in time, and then with the change, uh, we may have designed it inappropriately, perhaps, and how do we adapt? And to me, those are some of the really uh, grand challenges that we're going to be facing. Yeah, I guess um, I'll bring in a North Carolina example, and then if we have time, maybe a, a, a coral reef example. But um, going back to Gavin's comment about the rural communities and, and their ability to be resilient to climate change, um, they also need to be resilient just to the, the changing sort of economics of what's happening in the coastal zone. And this particular example involves, say, commercial fishermen in eastern North Carolina where uh, many fishermen are getting out of that, that industry for a variety of reasons. However, 
we look to Virginia and see that their oyster shellfish aquaculture industry is, is growing like crazy. It's, it's providing a lot of jobs, a lot of economic value. And so the state of North Carolina is investing in growing our shellfish aquaculture uh, industry. So what's happening, though, is that as, as we look at how to make decisions, inform decisions on where you permit an oyster aquaculture operation or not in these shallow coastal areas, we're starting to see potential resource conflicts. So for example, uh, if we start to loosen up the regulations on where we uh, would permit an oyster aquaculture operation, we might start to impact seagrass beds. So we're, we're one solution then is to try to generate the most accurate accounting of say what that seagrass is worth so that we can make the most informed decisions related to the cost benefits of either allowing the, the uh, industry to grow in a certain manner or, or, or not. And so an example of addressing this is that uh, we were funded by the Albemarle Pamlico uh, Estuarine Program. And the goal was to generate the uh, economic impact of seagrass loss in Pamlico Sound under five different loss scenarios over a 10-year period. And so what that required was the ecologist was looking for data that, that showed us what is the enhanced production, fisheries production for um, red drum, spotted sea trout, and blue crab. Uh, and then I worked with a, a fisheries modeler, Jay Chow, uh, in uh, CALS, and so he was able to plug that into his model and say, okay, here are the projections of the decline in fishery landings, whether it's recreational or, um, or commercial, due to these different scenarios of seagrass decline. And then we worked with uh, economists, so in this case, Sarah Sutherland at Duke and Roger Van Hafen here at, uh, at NC State, and they were able to monetize the impact, not only on the fishery, but monetize the, the economic impact in terms of loss of carbon sequestration, as well as the impact on uh, local real estate values. And so again, now we have a, a much more accurate prediction, which turns out is about $1,300 per acre seagrass loss, a much more accurate picture of the costs and benefits of these types of permitting decisions. So, so I think that's, that's one way to look into the, the future. And then another great example is uh, we also work in the Florida Keys coral reef system. And the, uh, the economic assets of that coral reef system is uh, over $8.5 billion. And so there's been a tremendous number of management decisions based on the need to try to recover, protect that highly degraded system that range from a network of marine protected areas that have different types of zoning, uh, either research only, public can use and no fish or open, open to fishing. It ranges from uh, local management of septic systems and building permits in the Florida Keys, but also upland, uh, looking at ways to promote the freshwater sheet flow of water through the Everglades and into Florida Bay, which also impacts this coral reef system. So again, just a, you know, a lot of great examples of looking forward, but we, I think the important thing is to make sure that we're accounting for, or, for the economic impact of these types of, of management decisions. Yeah, and I think the thing that emphasizes there's a, a positive or an encouraging aspect to this, it, it can look negative if you, you know, take everything that we're currently doing and just project it forward, um, you know, things start to look dire. Uh, barrier Islands, if we take our current rates of sea level rise and, and we don't make any management changes, you know, on a long enough timeline with enough sea level rise, all of our Barrier Islands will be lost. and we can build models for what that will look like both physically and for our Bear Island communities, um, you know, see the effects on the island, but also then, you know, how does that cascade to the, the inner banks or throughout the rest of the system? But, you know, humans are resilient and management practices can change. And it comes back to, to Gavin's point about, you know, what are the, the design conditions? What are we, what are we prioritizing as a community? And, um, there are things that we can do creatively to adapt and to, um, you know, uh, be resilient to these, these facing challenges. Reflecting what Casey um, uh, said is to, to think about, and I didn't, I didn't kind of finish my thought, I guess, with the, with the um, 
um, New Orleans example, is um, the levy system is one of many strategies that should be employed. In fact, New Orleans uh, is, is uh, drawing a lessons from the Dutch where they're allowing water to come into their communities, uh, living with water is what it's called. Um, but they're also looking at selective buyouts and or resettlement of at-risk properties. They're looking at enhanced building codes. They're looking at educating people about uh, future investment choices they've made. So my point is there should be a slew of policy choices and options that better reflect uh, resilience. The other thing I would just like to add to what Dave said, which I think is really important, when we think about resilience as a concept, uh, sometimes we get hung up on resilience as the notion of resilience and resistance, engineered versus non-engineered. That's just, that's a really narrow way of looking at physical elements of resilience, but there's also social and economic uh, resilience that is just as important. And that the whole thing of, of how do you link environmental resilience, economic resilience, and social resilience, very much like this panel, is how, do they, how are they coupled? And that's, that's really hard to do in practice. And I guess the last thing I'd say to add to some perhaps uh, positivity is that what I found interesting from a policy standpoint is, you know, a lot of communities throughout the U.S., especially coastal communities, are grappling with this issue and starting to make uh, investment choices and policy choices based on adaptation. And this was during a time of former presidency that was, that was basically acting as if climate change wasn't happening. So my point is, is that communities are starting to see it on a pretty broad basis and they're trying to act. Again, I think the challenge is gonna be how do we provide the tools and policies and funding and resources needed to allow them to succeed and to adapt over longer time scales. Um, any questions in the audience? If not, we'll keep rolling, but I really want to encourage the audience, both here and online, to speak up. Yes, ma'am. If, if I can bring to the mic, then that way. Hi. Okay. Okay. Uh, my question is, uh, when a country's disaster management policy is developed following Sendai Framework 2015 to 2030, where one of the four goals of this framework is deep community engagement. So uh, how plausible it is for that country to use bottom-up approach to engage people in disaster management process. Chitali, one of my students, so she put me on the spot here. I guess I better better respond. I will see how I do. Um, so I, you know, the Sendai framework and uh, the Hyogo framework and other global policy frameworks that um, have been developed are um, broad conceptual policy frameworks. Uh, trying to apply them at a national and a state level is challenging and local level. Uh, you know, how do you operationalize these broad concepts? I think the U.S. has done a, f in my opinion, uh, fair to poor job of uh, actually trying to operationalize it, going back to this bottom-up approach. You know, in the U.S., uh, we're in some ways a victim of our own wealth, if you will, in some ways, in that um, the approach that we've used historically is we provide a lot of money on the back end after disaster occurs. And we overwhelm local governments with those funding uh, resources, these complex programs. I would suggest that we're not investing nearly enough on the front end, which really goes back to Hyogo and other frameworks tied to development and or sustainable development, which is investing in building and kind of taking a development model uh, and investing more in local capacity building, knowledge building, use of indigenous knowledge, these types of issues that we've known for decades that uh, should be done and could be applied, and in fact, we were talking about this last night in class, is ironically in the U.S., USAID applies those principles when they're working overseas. Um, to me, it's ironic that I would argue that we're not doing that same thing. We're not investing nearly enough on the front end. Uh, it's not as exciting, it's not as sexy as dr developing and dropping tons of money uh, into a community after disaster, so you can wave the flag and say, I did something as a congressperson. Um, but that's not enough. In fact, it's, it's highly problematic. And when people are surprised at disaster recovery being a really slow, laborious process, it shouldn't be surprising to us uh, because we haven't built the capacity on the front end for these communities to even accept the aid, um, especially in smaller communities. So that's, uh, there's plenty of work to be done in that, uh, in that space. There's a huge challenge in creating capacity in communities and, yeah. and um, accepting the aid is is just one, but um, helping communities to kind of look at what's most valuable and how do they, what do they want to be like in the future and then what is possible within the realm of 
planetary boundaries or the natural system and the opportunities that are there, whether we're talking about different policy instruments, we're talking about natural processes, we're talking about natural infrastructure, we're talking about built infrastructure, we're talking about staying, going, um, and recreating all of those things. And when you put all of that pie together, it, it can become really, really overwhelming um, for, for communities to, to think about um, all of that. Any examples on uh, any of you, how you have worked with communities to sort of look at those trade-offs and what future uh, they desire? Last time we got together, we, we listened to some folks talking about, you know, how to work with communities. Um, and, you know, doing that from the start uh, can be extremely useful as opposed to just doing it after a disaster, but planning independently of a disaster. Um, any thoughts, any ideas, any examples? Maybe Casey, you're online. We'll stop, start with you this time and roll backwards. Sure, yeah, I, I don't have a ton of examples of that. We, we do have a current project with a postdoc of mine where we're working with um, Town and Ag's Head and looking at some of their beach nourishment data over the last 10 years and trying to build a model for, um, you know, how that nourishment will, will perform going forward to different climate scenarios. Um, and so this is building on work with a postdoc who has a lot of expertise in developing climate scenarios down to like daily weather patterns so that we can simulate a storm and uh, the conditions before and after that. And then linking that with a, a very detailed process-based model of the coastal erosion of the, the beach and the dune system. And then trying to link that forward and make you know predictions over 10 years or 30 years. Um, and this can be, uh, this kind of framework, these couple different models can be useful, I think, for decision making by a town like next Ed, where you know they're investing a ton of money into a beach nourishment they're expecting it to to perform over some span of eight or ten years as storms get stronger and and um, more frequent strong storms become more frequent uh, that nourishment uh, timeline might might shrink maybe it's every four or five years that they're starting to have to nourish and then you know does that feasible or is are there other adaptation techniques that they they might want to pursue so working with them with their, these data sets and then bringing this framework back um, to kind of think through those alternatives i don't know are there other um, examples okay. sure yeah i guess my um... simple answer to the last question that was posed is 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 location matters and stakeholders matter. So, you know, as we're talking about the dynamics of natural system, not all locations are the same. There are certain locations that uh, uh, might be important, what we call population sources and others population sinks. So it's really important to know um, the dynamics of even individual uh, locations of a habitat type. But that same concept of location mattering applies to these local communities. And it's really important to understand the belief networks of these local communities. So, for example, if that belief network is such that there's very strong internal uh, consensus that, that climate, climate change is not real, then you might want to think about other words and phrases that you're going to use to communicate whatever other concept you want to communicate. Um, and, and along that, that, that line, I've learned about uh, uh, including stakeholders, you know, the hard way by not including them on certain projects and then seeing the consequences. And so that's something that we think about uh, right off the bat with any project. And a good uh, example of that is you know, one, one, one uh, pattern that we see sometimes in fisheries is a distrust between the fishermen and the fishery scientists in terms of the status of a population. And the way a fishery population is often assessed is what's called a stock assessment. And so you would have uh, uh, sampling that's done independent of the fishery, and that way you can assess over time sort of the size, the health of that population. Once you have that stock assessment, then you can say, say that's a pie. You can give one slice of the pie to natural reproduction for the population, one slice of the pie to natural mortality that's going to take place, and then one slice of the pie could be divided up between commercial and, and recreational fishermen. And so, for example, uh, uh, oyster uh, population in North Carolina 
uh, the wild stocks are are the dominant footprint of oyster reefs in, in North Carolina, yet they're at only about 5 to 10 percent of their historic abundance. So there's a lot of interest in, in rebuilding the population, but of course a lot of interest and need to manage it sustainably. And so we have some funding from the Nature Conservancy to actually design a stock assessment survey for the natural population of oysters in, in North Carolina. And the, the sort of the conflict in that fishery is that the commercial fishermen harvest oysters a certain way by towing a dredge that's different from the way the division marine fisheries might tow a dredge and so they have very different perceptions on the health of that population so we have an advisory group for this project that consists of scientists fishery managers uh, NGOs, uh, but also with the fishermen, and we have actually teamed with fishermen to go out and do our fishery independent surveys to figure out how to design this survey. And it's been incredibly positive and informative in that we're getting to understand what are the belief networks of the fishermen, and in turn, they're understanding why it's important, for example, to have a standardized survey and how that standardized survey could actually help achieve the goal of a of a sustainable fishery that they could be employed in uh, uh, long term. So, thank you. Maybe I could just add a, a little bit to the, the uh, your original question. I was just thinking about two examples. One is a, um, a six-year study that I was part of where we looked at the quality of what are called hazard mitigation plans or risk reduction plans, which are required for states and local governments to develop if they want access to post-disaster funding. And there are tens of thousands of these plans all over the country. And actually, following our analysis, we found out that they were actually quite poor. They were meeting minimal standards. And in fact, these risk reduction plans could very well be modified to serve as climate change adaptation plans. But now we have a whole set of climate change adaptation plans that are being built all over the country, unrelated to the hazard mitigation plans that already exist. And so my point is, from a policy standpoint, in many cases, we have the institutional frameworks or the policies or programs in place to do what we need to do. You know, the standards might be really low, or communities don't have the capacity to even write the plans. And the plans, what we found is that they, the fundamental problems with these plans is that the risk assessments that were done, there's not a rational nexus between the findings of the risk assessment and the identification of policies or projects, whether it's armoring the shoreline, whether it's elevating houses, whether it's moving them to higher ground, whether it's green infrastructure, there's a disconnect between what we know about risk and the policies that they're looking to select. The third dimension of the study found that almost none of these plans address climate change adaptation, which is really disturbing because they could be integrated. So that's one example. The other example relative to uh, community engagement is um, uh, in 2016, after um, one of our many hurricanes uh, was asked by the governor's office and emergency management to lead a team, it was about uh, 13 faculty and 20 some odd graduate students for two years. Uh, I was actually working on this full time. Uh, we worked with six hard hit low capacity communities in eastern North Carolina to help them address issues that weren't being, being active or addressed by uh, FEMA and or the Stafford Act related programs. Uh, including what do you do with land post buyout and a whole host of other issues. And we worked with them for two years uh, deeply, uh, almost every day, uh, and that wasn't long enough. And it was really sobering for me to realize that two years of deep community engagement full time wasn't enough. It needed to be full time every day, nonstop. And it really struck me that, and we've written about this, is that it's, uh, it goes to the point that communities need ongoing assistance. If two years isn't enough of deep community engagement, um, we need to think of a different way of doing things. And one of the things I'm really interested in exploring is how do we take the land grant model, how do we take um, what we know about agricultural extension and extension agents that are on the ground, uh, that maybe we train them up or we, maybe we create a hazards extension agent or something that's on the ground that's trusted, that helps build coalitions and communities as part of their day-to-day -day work but how do we have them there on the ground uh, every day of the year instead of you know dropping in and working uh, even two years uh, wasn't enough. So again, to me, this is an example of um, kind of maybe unrealized potential, both of a national policy uh, relative to the hazard mitigation plans, but also the idea of community engagement. I think we need to rethink you know what that means. It should be enduring. It shouldn't be episodic, even if it's only even if it's two years, uh, that wasn't enough. Uh, 
Kimberly Nelson, if you would like to unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, thank you. All right, so I'm really enjoying the panel so far. Thank you all so much for doing this. Uh, I'm curious if you could offer maybe some advice uh, in terms of practically, how do you go about engaging these community partners? So I've been in North Carolina since 2017. I think the best example I have of meaningfully engaging community partners, uh, it happened pretty serendipitously. It didn't feel like I really had some sort of um, strategy or deliberate plan. It was more so that I ended up connecting with Chuck Wyrick, who was an extension agent with Sea Grant at the time. And just through a conversation with him, we ended up coming up with an idea for a project and he had connected me with a few people. Um, but I find myself wanting to be more engaged with different community groups, but I don't have a very good sense of how to do that in a way that is sincere and it's not just me maybe poking around sending cold emails or something. So I'm curious if you have any practical advice. Yeah, Nat Natalie, great question. I, I think one um, opportunity that I've seen work quite well, hasn't worked that well lately because of COVID, but uh, we do have the North Carolina Marine Science and Education Partnership. And it's based in Carteret County uh, but it does include our sister campuses at uh, ECU and, and UNC Wilmington. It's led by the Carteret County Economic Development Office, and it consists of the directors of the marine labs, the superintendent of the public schools, the president of the community college, uh, the, the directors of the local marine labs, whether it's Division Marine Fisheries or, or NOAA. Uh, I know that uh, you've worked with the... Um, a shellfish sanitation office and so um, they're represented as well and so it's a great opportunity to um, to bring up uh, issues ideas uh, I enjoy uh, what I enjoy most about that meeting actually is we just have a round table we, we just go around the round table there and everybody just provides an update on what's happening at their lab or their program and then the conversations that happen offline in terms of creating collaborations and partnerships or putting you in touch, for example, with a certain Down East community for a particular study or with a certain um, a group of oyster fishermen. So I think, I think that's a great model. Uh, perhaps we need that model in the northern part of the state as well as the southern part of the state. And I'm hopeful that after COVID, we'll actually be able to start meeting uh, in, in person again. Casey? Can I ask a quick follow-up, just really quick to what Dave mentioned? Um, so then to engage with that group, for example, would you basically be the representative from NC State? <laughs> I, I, I mean, how would I then insert myself into this process? Exactly, or um, with, with Sea Grant. So Sea Grant is at the table as well. And so you could, and Sea Grant is a great opportunity or, or great uh, mechanism to uh, intersect with the communities that you're interested in intersecting with. So I, I would say either through myself, uh, Susan White, John Fear, uh, you know, all the uh, uh, Frank Lopez at Sea Grant. Uh, so those would be, I think, the two uh, fastest ways to connect. And happy to do it, Natalie. Yeah, Natalie, there's also, um, if you want to check out the recording from our last panel, there were four folks who focused explicitly on two-way community engagement and uh, um, what that means and how you learn to be more effective in doing that. And Jean Goodwin is going to be offering some some direct assistance this coming semester. I've forgotten the details of how um, to hook into that. Um, there's also um, other kinds of training for faculty. It's not a skill that we necessarily learn. We join the faculty because we're, we're interested in teaching and we do great research, but how we connect with communities, how we listen, how we don't just drop in solutions and walk away that they may or may not want, but really design our research programs and iteratively interact with communities to provide a benefit um, is really a, 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 learned, a learned skill and one I hope we keep, uh, keep talking about. Um, I, other questions? I would just quickly, I would add, um, you know, emphasize the Sea Grant connection. I, the few meaningful uh, connections that I have to coastal stakeholders have all been enabled through NC Sea Grant. And it's nice um, because Sea Grant can facilitate both ways. Uh, the Sea Grant professionals can also come back to me and nudge me a little bit on it, it, maybe that's maybe there's a better way to do this, uh, to think about this um, before they, they introduce or bring that idea to a stakeholder. Um, 
And so I, there's a Sea Grant professional on the phone call who I've just recently begged for help uh, doing some of this stuff. So uh, I, I really uh, value those, those kinds of connections. A professional in the room as well, and Sea Grant has a lot of, of great um, um, potential to, to, to help uh, with that. Susan, I don't know if you want to add anything. comment in the box who said I'll speak for Sea Grant and thank you Natalie for bringing up a really important point at Sea Grant we talk a lot about how building relationships takes a lot of time and trust real quick add just one uh, one thought and it's based on experience uh, with hundreds of communities in the US and, and overseas is uh, it's something you've probably already thought about but is uh, doing some homework and finding out who are the trusted leaders in that community and trying to connect with them uh, I guess one last note I would say is that what I found especially in North Carolina is that if you say you're from NC State uh, people listen um, they actually respect the idea I think I'm, I'm pretty sure that it has to do with Sea Grant uh, and it has to do with the history of extension um, and so that's a real plus so you've already got that going for you um, we have a question over there. Yeah, following up on Gavin's comments about the federal government injecting large amounts of money after disasters, uh, I was on a webinar yesterday by the U.S. Forest Service about a particular research grant program that they have going on innovations in sustainable wood products and when they got to talking about the amount of funding that they have available, uh, they said that if the infrastructure bill passes, they will have more than 10 times the amount that they currently have, and they'll have it like this year. <laughs> it was pretty staggering uh, from a research perspective, you know, to hear those kind of numbers. So do you have any thoughts about how the infrastructure bill could affect coastal resilience and coastal resilience research? But just uh, what I, the part I do know about is uh, there is a new national program, the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program that's administered by FEMA. And we're actually studying it at the request of FEMA and advising them on how to uh, utilize it. And one of the things we keep pushing is trying to invest more on capacity building. And we did a national survey of states and territories. And uh, one of the things that we found in our survey, which is really sobering, is that they actually have a grant that communities can apply for that will fund them to write a grant. Uh, and of the tens of thousands of communities across the US, 15 communities applied for that grant. Uh, that to me is really sobering, it's really troubling uh, because either they don't know about it or it's too much trouble to apply for a modest grant to help them write a big grant that deals with green infrastructure that could be a, a multi-million dollar uh, grant that would be given to a community. Uh, this grant program is new, it's been out one year, and it's extremely complex. It's very difficult to administer, even though within FEMA's national strategy, they talk about simplifying the, the process. So there's a disconnect, um, and these are, these are real issues that are happening, and they are going to be putting money into that grant program, so it, could, it will be tens of billions, perhaps $100 billion, uh, it, just for that program to help develop green infrastructure. But it's very difficult, and it's the communities. Uh, that have the staffing, the technical expertise, and the ability to write good grants are going to get it. And they're getting it. The first tranche uh, was given largely to, um, you know, fairly wealthy uh, communities with high degrees of technical sophistication. There's going to be a lot of information rolling what's in the infrastructure bill. I did get some bullets this morning, which I was too busy to really read, but some of it's actually just in the, in the paper. But a lot of what the money is going to be spent on has yet to be determined. So there are broad categories and money is being passed to the various federal agencies. Some of that is going to be passed down to the states. And so st stay tuned. There's going to be, there is a lot of opportunity in the bill. There's even more opportunity in the second bill if that uh, bill is, is passed. But it, it is certainly something to, to watch. Mary Jean Goodwin uh, commented that it's the STIR program. And it is, She, if you're online, she placed that link in the chat, but it's also on our website under uh, resources and available positions. And the deadline for that application is December 3rd. It includes a small stipend 
as well as an integration with public engagement. Thank you, Jeannie. Appreciate that. Mine like a steel trap this morning. I could not remember that, that name. Okay, uh, other questions in the room or online? Or comments? Question? Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. So just glancing at all of your research, um, it seems to me that there's a really interesting intersection in all of what you do between natural and human systems, which is why you're asked to speak here. But you all also speak to communities and advise them through fisheries or um, Dr. Dietrich through um, uh, hazard management offices. I'm curious to know of the research questions that you've asked and investigated here at NC State, what have you been surprised, like what surprised you about how it was uh, received by the communities that you worked with? You know, what was something that you didn't necessarily necessarily expect to happen as a result of uh, some questions that you were asking and how have you managed that uh, that expectation being met met or not met Dave you want to start yeah, so, so I have um, uh, quite a few examples and so I'll, I'll start out with the uh, the frustrating example and then I'll highlight a, a, an example that I think is uh, very um, energizing so the frustrating example is um, and this is a, a little bit of a long story because it does bring in um, uh, hurricanes and the need to be thinking about how these large events are impacting uh, uh, the uh, fisheries and how humans are responding. And so uh, in, in 1999, we had three sequential hurricanes, Floyd, Dennis, and Irene. And that generated, at least at the time, 500-year flooding, which it seems like we see a lot more often than, than every 500 years. And and the, the response of the blue crabs to, to that flooding was a mass migration down, down the rivers. The human response was the crabbers were moving their crab pots one mile, two miles down river every day to track this migration of crabs. And then the population of crabs basically um, were kind of what I call hyper-aggregated in areas of relatively high salinity in Pamlico Sound. And the fishermen targeted those areas, as, as you might uh, anticipate. And in 1999 and going into 2000, the catch efficiency of blue crab statewide went up 370%. Well, what happened was the spawning stock, which is how we try to manage the blue crab, one of the main ways, uh, went from what was a relatively stable state at a high level to a relatively low stable state. And uh, uh, to kind of wrap up the story, we had been doing a lot of research on looking at the fishery independent data, analyzing that to suggest that, yeah, this population was being fished uh, greater than maximum sustainable yield, and we needed to uh, really clamp down on how we're harvesting and managing the spawning stock. And what was frustrating is that nothing was done about it. And so this was 2000, and here we are, 2021, and that population that spawning stock level has not come back. And I think the resistance was, again, um, trying to manage a, a fishery that was the number one fishery in the state that has a lot of uh, economic power but also uh, political power. And so it was, it was just frustrating to not get any traction on, at least from the scientific perspective, was, was pretty clear that we needed to do. So. Uh, so then I started working on oyster restoration, and it was the exact opposite. So now we are all working together, whether it's Division Marine Fisheries, uh, NGOs such as the Coastal Federation and the Nature Conservancy, uh, uh, other, other university research teams. And it's been great because uh, the Coastal Federation has been sort of herding all of us cats and coordinating our effort uh, so that we are trying to synergize and, and, and not be redundant and sharing uh, information and projects and sort of a common goal of advising best practices with respect to uh, things ranging from uh, restoration to shellfish aquaculture to the cult shell recycling program and, and on and on. And that has been uh, very energizing and, and inspiring uh, from, a, from a scientific and, and personal career perspective. Great. Um, well, we are uh, winding down a, a little bit. Um, on time, so let me ask just one other thing. You, we've talked about disasters, and we we all are 
counting down the days and in terms of uh, November being the last month of hurricane season and maybe we dodged a bullet this year, we are not going to have a disastrous hurricane in, in North Carolina. And we think about the damage and the significant negatives that come with disasters. Are there positives that come from disasters as well? Opportunities to try new things, um, opportunities to change the way we do business, to, to help address challenges that can't be addressed if we're just sort of thinking about an amorphous and overwhelming future in the face of, of global climate change. Any ideas there? Take it. Dave's looking at me like, go ahead. Go ahead. I think yeah, that's it. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll, I'll get a, a, a description of this. So, from a policy standpoint, you know, there's a pretty rich literature on uh, policy learning. And in fact, um, one of the faculty members here at NC State, uh, Tom Berkland, um, has written about this extensively. Um, and, you know, there's a, it's a real mixed bag. There is some policy learning that happens, um, but there's also a lot that we're not learning. Um, and, that, you know, that, um, for example, the study that we did on the quality of hazard mitigation plans, we're not learning that uh, the plans could be a more effective tool to reduce risk, uh, th but instead they're typically viewed as a means to gain access to post-disaster hazard mitigation funding and other funding sources. But certain preconditions that, uh, or, or what we would often refer to as internal determinants, if you will, using the policy um, uh, diffusion literature um, or policy innovation literature, is there are certain factors that can lead to uh, this. And for example, um, you know, if Tom has uh, compared uh, the lesson drawing from earthquake risk reduction and kind of hurricane related um, activities. And what he found in the earthquake community, which I think is instructive for us at the university, is one of the reasons that there's been pretty significant uh, policy learning on the earthquake domain is that because respected scientists, geologists, and engineers, and others engaged in a thoughtful way and they had entree into the policymaking process. And so they were able to use their knowledge and their scientific data to inform policy. That's a, that's, it was a, there was a pretty clear path, and Tom has talked about that pretty extensively. So to me, if you were to use that approach, um, you know, I've talked a fair amount about the, the, uh, the cynicism, if you will, of public policy, but uh, there are examples of when, you know, universities and research and others can really make a difference. Tracy, any thoughts on that one? Hey, Gavin's answer is much, much better than mine. My, the opportunities I see, are, I'm all very selfish about, so just trying to get more data to constrain some of our models, um, especially if you think about coastal erosion models, there are not a lot of field or experimental data at all on how a breach fails and so trying to constrain an erosion or sorry sorry how a dune fails and, and you get overwash onto a, a coastal highway or, or into a coastal community um, and so we run these models we try to make these predictions but uh, we, we don't have a good feeling for just how accurate they are and you try to go out and get data you know immediately after a storm the bulldozers are, are out and they're pushing sand off the roadways and away from the infrastructure and uh, very quickly you're you're losing uh, data that that could help to improve predictions in the future so like i said my my opportunities are, are all selfish trying to to better constrain and, and better develop our models just real quick uh, again, selfishly, in fact, I'm just thinking my students would probably be disappointed if I didn't mention our own research that we're doing on uh, policy innovation and buyouts. And there's two pieces. One is the internal determinants, those characteristics that lead to innovation. And then there's also what we call policy diffusion, the degree to which innovation is being shared. And we're looking at and finding those characteristics that lead to innovation. But we're also finding that a lot of the people that are doing innovative work are not sharing it with their colleagues nationwide. And that's a, that's a gap. That's a real gulf that we need to, uh, to improve upon. I guess just a quick comment in terms of the, the, the future, I'd like to speak to the students. I think it's a great time to be thinking about a career in this space of co coastal resilience and sustainability. Um, I know in, in my career, I'm in the Department of Marine, Earth, and Atmospheric Sciences, and it's, uh, it's really energizing to be in an interdisciplinary department and also be at NC State, where there's so much uh, depth and breadth of expertise to be able to work in that interdisciplinary space. Uh, it's it's uh, energizing. It's inspiring as a as a scientist, and 
uh, as you all know, the, the world's population, uh, much of it is concentrated in coastal zones, which is also the uh, kind of epicenter of a lot of what we're talking about. And so the, the challenges, the questions are going to become more complicated and more numerous. And so I think the ability to communicate with these different disciplines, you know, again, I talked about the four components of these coupled human uh, natural systems. And so, again, just working in one of those areas, being able to communicate into the other components, I think, is just a real plus. And, and to have uh, students that can, you know, think critically about uh, the data sets that m they might be analyzing, if you think about uh, big data analytics, uh, and also be able to just kind of, you know, synthesize uh, information and put different disparate pieces together in terms of this, this, this puzzle that we're trying to solve. I think it's a great time to be in this, this uh, career space. It is a great time to be in this career space, and I think there's enormous opportunity. We're all watching COP26 and what's happening there, and some reasons for optimism, some i do not quite sure what's going to happen, but, um, you know, there are, there are lots and lots of, of things happening that give me a lot of hope. The whole field of ecosystem restoration that's kind of taking off. Um, Gavin has mentioned green infrastructure a couple of times. We haven't talked about that. Really a lot of learning about how to do policy different, how to look at sustainable economic development in communities and helping communities, working with communities to think about a future that is a little bit different under climate change scenarios. And I do hope everyone stays engaged in, and looks for those, those things that, that provide um, hope for the future, but also a different pathway forward. Hope, we need hope, but we also need to sort of get into what are the, what are the opportunities and then how do we go about systematically exploring them and determining which are real and, and which are not. I'd also encourage you, I've, um, I was, I've been cleaning up my office and there's just a short two-page paper in PNAS from a couple of years ago, what kind of science is sustainability science, and it's still instructive a couple of years later. Um, students looking for something to read, um, all kinds of, of, of opportunities there. This is going to be um, the last session this fall, the session we are going to have in a week. Um, we were compressed because the holidays are, are there and it hasn't quite come together, so we're going to kick it forward uh, into early in the spring semester. But we're looking for ideas. Um, what those of you who are here today, um, and we'll figure out a way to get something out on our website as well to solicit broader input. But what what would be beneficial to you, our engaged group of um, 200 plus folks, and all the students who we haven't counted yet? Um, what would be useful to you in in uh, continuing to develop uh, this initiative around coastal resilience and sustainability? And we'll put some another event series together in the spring, as well as some other things um, that are in the hopper um, that will be announced on our website. So stay tuned for, for, for all of those. And uh, really thank you for, for joining us. And I uh, hope you have a great rest of the day. And thank you very much to our panelists, Dr. Casey Dietrich uh, online and on the big screen here in the room, uh, Dave Eggleston and Gavin Smith. We really appreciate your time and ideas and thinking and uh, um, you've pushed us forward and that's a good thing. Thank you very much. Thank you.